Hello, ladies and gentlemen and non-binary friends. If it's your first time here, welcome. If it's not, welcome back to Actors With Issues with me, your host, Juan Ayala, bringing you a special roundtable interview in honor of Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, joined by four delightful actors you've seen across film and television and media. With us today, we have Ludi Lin from Mortal Kombat and the CW's Kung Fu, Ashley Birch from The Ghost and Molly McGee and Mythic Quest, Leigh Lewis from Nancy Drew on The CW, and joining us once again, Eddie Liu from Kung Fu on the CW as well. Ludi, Ashley, Leia, Eddie, thank you all so much for being here. How's everyone? Awesome. Really good. Thanks, good. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Super happy to be here. Uh, so uh, uh, we were just chatting for about 20 minutes, wish we had all of that <laughs> silliness and just <laughs> warm up to share. Um, but I'd love to start with uh, with the following question. So looking back at the history of entertainment and of the entertainment industry, is now the best time to be an Asian American actor? Whoever wants to chime in. I absolutely think so. I feel like now more than ever, I mean, it's always good to be an Asian American actor, (laughs) Um, but I think now more than ever, a lot of the opportunities that are opening up and just how well fleshed out they are, the fact that those opportunities are even here to begin with, um, which I know from people from, the community and just earlier generations have not been able to experience. Um, it's really beautiful to be alive during this time and being able to be a part of those opportunities. And also just like watch things that like, I didn't have when I was younger, like literally not only being a part of these things, but also getting to be someone who feels represented every single time I watch someone else in um, some of the stuff that was coming out. Okay, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, yeah. I would agree. And I would also say that to your point, Leah, like the specificity also with which the like representation is becoming is so cool. Like Mm -hmm. in the cartoon that I'm in, I play a Thai American girl, which I never thought in a million years that there would be, there's not one, but two shows on Disney channel that have Thai girls in them. And when I was a kid, I was like, I'll just, whatever is Asian, I will just, I will be like Mulan, I guess is what I have. Um, Mm -hmm. But now it's so cool to see that like, you don't have to go, you, you can, you can have a representation that is exactly who you are and maybe exactly what your family looks like rather than like an approximation, like, well, they're not white. So that helps. But now it's like, no, that that's the food that I eat. That's the stuff that my mom does when she prays. Mm. That's, you know, that specificity is so cool. I feel like objectively speaking, yeah, of course, it's the best time we've ever had. Um, And it's I think it is worth noting, like when you take the broad spectrum, if you look at the entire picture, like where we started, we had barely anything. So anything to any point to where we've gotten now is thankfully and should be better than what we had. And if it's not, there's like a something grossly terrible, terribly wrong happening. Right. Um, And so I, I do know that it's an ebb and flow for depending on who you ask at any given moment, whether it's in 2019 in the summertime, 2019 in the wintertime, or like to 2022 now where some people feel like, Oh my God, the market is booming for Asians. And like having our Caucasian counterparts tell us, wow, it must be so great to be Asian. Meanwhile, (laughs) meanwhile, I have so many of my peers and my friends from within the community who are like, who constantly know what it's like to go in for a role, a breakdown that says specifically looking for Asian, looking for open ethnicity, and then seeing that through line from start to finish. And then the the character, the person who they cast ends up being a Caucasian actor. Mm -hmm. And that happens multiple times. And it's like, okay, there's nothing black and white here. Like, yes, things are getting better. Yes, things are the best they've ever been. But there's so much gray area in between. And that's the that's the whole point. Like that's why we're even here still talking about this. If everything was solved, we don't even need to have this conversation. We could just be have like a like a like a postmortem, like, wow, look how far we've come. And end of sentence. But that's not, that's just not the full truth of it. Well, I think of it as like a tube of toothpaste, right? At least <clears throat> at least at least the North American um, film industry because I grew up, I was born in China and I grew up all over the place. So I've seen, when I was growing up in China and Hong Kong, I, I, I know what Asian actors, because all I saw were Asian actors acting in very nuanced roles, right? But I think um, what Eddie was talking about, this boom, I think of it as a tube of toothpaste because it's like the cat was squeezed on for a long time and nothing was able to come out in terms of Asian representation. 
And when it comes out, and you know, when you get that like first hard gunky bit of toothpaste, <laughs> right, you have to get over that. And like, that's all you get at first. And that's like the, the, the few actors right now are being highlighted over and over again. And that's all you see mm. in terms of our representation in media. But there's like a whole gamut. That's the good stuff behind it. That's the toothpaste you want to get to is when you know that soft nice stuff gets squeezed out and it's all bubbly on your teeth and your gums <laughs> that's, yeah that's the real stuff where you want to get to when it becomes normalized when it becomes normal toothpaste yes yes i love that analogy <laughs> yeah. no really that, that, that. yeah that's a great analogy <laughs> when, when when the toothpaste is out of the tube you, you will never be able to squeeze it back in the toothpaste is not going back in the tube. So we've, we're exploding and we're not going back. Right. Yeah, it really, it, and again, so like as Eddie said, sort of looking at the, the broad spectrum, it's always been sort of uphill, thankfully. And just that everything is, sort of, thankfully with representation, it is just always going to continue improving. I don't think, hopefully there won't be a time where it's sort of like, well, that was when everything was booming and now it's over. Like it, it hasn't felt like a trend, you know, oh, especially God, yeah. ever since, some of these sort of like tentpole um, projects, like um, was between like 2018 and 2020, you had Crazy Rich Asians, you had The Farewell, and like so many other sort of like major studio films with all of this representation. And we'll get into some numbers uh, in a bit uh, regarding all of the representation. Um, but I'd like to go back and um, chat about like the earliest memory each of you have of feeling represented for the first time in in uh, something that you saw on tv in a film or even in theater and um Moody, i'm especially curious whenever we have folks who are not born in the states because you sort of had that round the clock representation um so i'm curious what that was like for you and and what you noticed in the difference in representation from here uh, or from where you grew up to the states Right. Well, I think it's a really interesting question. And, and this representation thing has been going around in my mind for a long time in terms of like what it means to be represented and how actually important it is to be to like see yourself represented on screen and what it does to you. Because a lot of the people that I've asked and I've talked to um, when they were growing up, they didn't know that they weren't being represented. They just mm -hmm. they knew what they liked. Like if I saw like if you see Mulan or whatever on TV, you're like, oh, I like that a lot. Um, but when you don't, you try to you all you always try to squeeze yourself into like whatever you, you feel relates to you. And I think the the amazing thing about the human condition is that there's always something that's relatable. But um, but in terms of things that get your culture right and the amazing beautiful thing that is to preserve your culture, that's different. So when I grew up, um, I a lot of times I didn't feel represented, even though I saw a lot of Chinese people on TV, but I, some people I couldn't relate to. And the first time um, when I saw a Stephen Chow movie, um, I don't know if the audience knows like who that is, but he was an amazing comedian. He, he had these like wacky, goofy comedies that just make me crack up and I can watch it over and over again. And um, that's the first time I felt like that's who I want to be. He was he was cool and funny. That's who I wanted to be. Um, and then when I moved overseas, I didn't see a lot of that. I didn't see, you know, my image on the screen. Um, and I, I lost the sense of um, the, the meaning I had about representation and seeing yourself. And it really wasn't until very recently when I when I saw Farewell, actually, I was like, oh, they've got some stuff right there. And I went, that's really nice. It's entertaining and it's nuanced and it's like a special story about bridging. I think it's about the nuance, right? Because I saw Farewell, I'm like, yes, they got the fine points right. And then recently when I saw Turning Red, um, <laughs> I was like, not only is it Canada, Toronto, they have like Canadian bills and areas in Toronto and it's about like Asian Americans and, and the things, you know, the, the relationships and interactions. Um, that was amazing. That was beautiful. And, uh, Ashley, what about you? What comes to mind as, as the first time that you felt seen and represented? Um, I mean, much in the same way. I don't, I don't think I ever really felt represented. Um, I mean, I, I come from a mixed race family and I sort of got as close as I could. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I liked seeing any type of non-white 
woman on screen because they remind you know when I was younger I liked I was a big Disney kid so I you know Esmeralda and Pocahontas even though they were extremely sexualized they had my mom's skin color so that was fun for me to see um but I never felt like any of the characters that I saw on TV or in movies were me um I I don't think I felt represented <laughs> until this show <laughs> um because it it wow. really is um a mixed race family where the mother is Thai the father is Irish and mm. um wow. and how that actually looks and plays out and the as you as you were saying the specificity of Thai culture being represented there it's truly the first time I've ever had that experience other than that That's I've good. just been trying to relate to things that are as close as I can get um yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. did they write it for you? Sorry, sorry for interrupting, but yeah, they so, you, so it's they, like... they decided whoever they cast as that character that they would base uh, her ethnicity <laughs> on on the actor. Um, so wow. originally they had no intention of making it about a Thai girl, uh, and then now uh, our creators Bob and Bill, they're very lovely men, <laughs> know way more about Thai <laughs> culture than they probably ever thought they would know. Um, but That's yeah. Awesome. It was really that was really really special and it's enriched the story that's the other thing about all of this is that the cultural specificity is actually perfect for the show because it's about a ghost and thai culture is a lot about spirits and honoring spirits and um it was like kismet and it really enhances the relationship between molly and her friend scratch who's a ghost and it just makes the show richer and the story richer by that specificity um, which is, I think, another reason to to work toward more specific representation is because it makes stories more interesting as well. Mm -hmm. And it's so wonderful to see that sort of representation. And despite how specific it sounds, it's still so relatable. And that's how you know they really nailed it. Um, there's a there's a show on um, FX on Hulu, Reservation Dogs. I don't know if you guys have watched it. It is like one of my favorite new yeah, comedies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about um, I started it. Yeah. It's so great. It's um, about four uh, indigenous teenagers growing up in on a res in rural Oklahoma. And it sounds very specific, but you're like, oh, that's like my little brother. Oh, that one's like my friend. Oh, that's me. I'm the leader. I'm or the wannabe leader. Mm -hmm. It's a, such a wonderful show seeing that sort of mind you, it's from Sterling Harjo and Taika Waititi. So it's like everything they do is gold. Uh, uh, and just seeing that sort of um, super specific, but still so wonderfully broadly relatable for so many people um and if you guys haven't watched the ghost of molly mcgee it's on disney plus so go watch it because it's absolutely <laughs> wonderful <laughs> uh and eddie what about for you what was the first uh, <clears throat> time you felt represented well uh growing up as like a chinese american kid uh again like you know like ashley and, and you know and all of us in here to some extent well for me a lot of there was a lot of shoehorning myself into an identity i would just mm -hmm. be like oh there's a clean shaven cis white guy who look kind of boyish and I just often attach myself to that sidebar. Mm -hmm. I had a weird thing where if a character, if a man had like, I didn't identify myself with female characters. I just, I just went to the guys. Right. Um, but if the male character had like facial hair, like a beard or a mustache, I just didn't, I wasn't into that. I don't know why <laughs> maybe it was like a future, like telling that I knowing that uh, maybe it was like a prediction that I knew I couldn't grow facial hair in the future <laughs> or something. Anyway, <laughs> of course I watched Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan and, and, and all that stuff. And of course I loved it. And of course it was such a huge influence on me even to this day. Right. And, and on, on, on my job now with, you know, where, where Ludi and I work. Right. And, um, uh, and, and it still left an impression, but then now and again, I would see, an Asian American man on screen once in a while who didn't have an Asian accent, who wasn't from China and wasn't some sort of eternal foreigner. Mm. And he'd be goofy and he'd speak completely neutral and no one made fun of his accent or anything. There was no nod or reference or uh, 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 any mention of like, there didn't have to be a mention that he was Asian. And those small standout moments were the ones that knock me back and it was like wait a second what's going on here why is this guy being viewed as so normal why does it feel so normal why can't i have more of this and it was it would be so profound for me so like you know i mean this isn't the first example but like honestly chan cho <clears throat> yelling milf in american pie that was huge for me 
he got to be this doofy all American type of dude who just blended in with a crowd of mostly white guys, but just being a bro and just fitting in normal and everyone being in on the joke together, the joke in that moment being Stifler's mom. Right. But like, that was incredibly profound for me and memorable. Um, when I saw Romeo must die, of course, Jet Li's a hero. And of course you root for him. And then spoiler alert for those who haven't seen it, Russell Wong's character, they're supposed to be like close friends in the movie. And then Russell turns out to be the traitor in the, in the family. And then they have to fight each other in the end. But Russell, I mean, you go back to like Vanishing Sun. I mean, that guy was paving the way for us when he was doing that for, I, I think it was, was it Warner Brothers TV? I think, um, but like he, in this movie, Jet Li was often the stoic, does, doesn't say a lot, the silent, deadly type. But then you have Russell playing this boisterous, charismatic, charming guy who was like, even in the middle of the fight, so much charm and personality came out of him. And I, and, and I, I those, those were the most influential for me, um, you know, cause especially cause like Jet Li's character is like from Hong Kong and then Russell, he's like very Asian American. And then there's like, you could see there, there are two very different kinds of Asian being represented in that head to head fight right there. So stuff like that. Um, there was this one guy in a, uh, 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 in one, one year of the Power Rangers, they did like Power Rangers in space or something like that. And there was a character <laughs> named Kai who was the Blue Ranger. And that was back when I realized that when I picked up on that, there would be a trend going forward where an Asian American actor would often be the Blue Power Ranger. That be, sort of became a thing. I don't know how that started. I'm not an expert on that stuff, but I thought that was cool. Was that, Kai. Was that, was that Archie Kao? I, it was Archie Kao. Yeah, 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 That's exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, Neutral yeah. accent. He was kind of like a little grumpy, a little like <laughs> he's, abrasive he's very, to, as, a, as a character. Very he's very Sorry? interesting. He's, he's very Asian American. He's like flat out Asian American. But he had a great, he went to, he went back to China and he had a great career there for a while. And then he, uh, yeah. I would see him just like memorizing Mandarin lines phonetically. This, this is a sidebar, but a very wow. funny story is that he would memorize these things phonetically and he would work like day and, not, and night and, you know, throughout the night to memorize the Mandarin lines. And then, um, wow. and then one day the director comes up to him and he's like, Archie, why are you, why are you so tired all the time? He's like, man, I'm, I'm <laughs> having hard time with these lines. I'm trying to memorize them phonetically. He's like, why are you doing that? We're just going to dub you anyway. <laughs> Oh no! No! Stop! <laughs> no way! No! Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah a lot funny. of Chinese media get gets dubbed just because sometimes the sound quality is off, or like it, it happens all the time. It's like oh, um, almost the function be there. So wow. then, then, then ended up. Uh, so so sometimes when he's you know on set, he would just he would just recite the alphabet. He would go A B C D. EFG, HIJK, and he would act the alphabet <laughs> and they could just dub the line in later. Anyway. Oh, no. Brilliant. <laughs> that's so funny. That's funny. Um, <laughs> well, uh, Michelle Yeoh talked about doing something like that back in the day when they started that as well because they didn't do like, like the they watermelon didn't have... trick. Well, I was the watermelon that trick. Watermelon. It's when you're like, in a, you're like, when you're in a crowd singing, you don't know the lyrics. You're like, watermelon, watermelon. And it looks like you're saying the exact lyrics. <laughs> I don't know that trick. I'm going to have to try that. Um, yeah. Oh, that and I right? also. Watermelon Sugar came about. It's just like taking the trick into an actual song. Watermelon, watermelon sugar. sugar. Oh, that's funny. I mean, it's a great <laughs> oh, maybe. song. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. Wow. I didn't, I didn't Can somebody text cool. Harry and ask him? <laughs> I'm on it. Um, Hold on. <laughs> I do have to. I also have to shout out Dante Bosco. Seeing him in Hook. Dante oh. Bosco. I didn't I didn't feel like I identified with his character as a personality because I was just a shy, timid kid. But he had so much fucking swagger and so much confidence. And it just his charisma just oozed, like just blasted you in the face off screen as like a what was he like 13, 14, 15 at the time? I don't know how young he was, but just mm -hmm. I'm like, wait, he's Asian, but he doesn't act like anyone else I know. And um that was that was kind of mind blowing for my brother and I as like little kids watching that movie mm -hmm. and uh leia what about for you honestly similar to a lot of other people here you know i i grew up in um a mixed culture as well like my family i was adopted from shanghai china and my parents are from new york and from jacksonville florida and you know they made it a very important thing to kind of infuse Chinese culture the best that they could being, you know, American parents um, and trying to have me, you know, associate with other Chinese people and also watch Chinese films. I remember watching 
interesting enough, like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, I know it's like the biggest classic ever, but that was one of the first Chinese movies that I ever really saw. And my father was really, really into um, martial arts and just like that whole world in general. And I remember watching it and being like, okay, this is really cool. But what the hell? Like, I'm like a five-year-old kid. Or like, I mean, I wasn't thinking what the hell at five years old. But I was definitely <laughs> thinking like, you know, similarly to Ashley, like there were so many characters I had growing up that because they were never really specified. And also it's really, there's very rarely any like Asian American culture stories as well. Um, I never really felt represented. And there were always these characters like, um, I remember when I was younger, I was watching this show, um, Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, this character, London Tipton, played by Brenda Song. And she was like this girly girl who was like, oh my God, and, like, blah, 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 blah. and I was like, there was always some Asian character that had to be larger than freaking life. And that's just not what we are in real life. I mean, I'm sure there are characters like that, but you know, similarly to what Eddie said, like it was very rare to find like a character just literally like existing and being a human being and walking to school or just, you know, getting a bite to eat. And it's not like the crazy Asian or the smart Asian or like the something Asian. And for me, interesting enough, like it wasn't for years until I, I, I saw myself into all the boys I've ever loved before. Like I remember watching that and being like, I'm not in high school anymore, but I'm looking at this girl who a normal girl in high school who didn't have some kind of catch to her that made her like the sidekick best friend or like the nerd who saves the day at the end of the movie that you haven't seen all movies since like the first scene. Um, and she was beautiful and she fell in love. Like she had a, a guy who liked her. And I'm just like, that is, that's crazy to me. Cause also growing up, like it was never the Asian girl. It was always the white girl who was like the coveted one. So to actually see a main character and also like a main character be the center of her own life. Like that was like groundbreaking for me. And also like just as an actress gave me so much hope for the future of like, oh my God, like is this the start of like, you know, more stories like this happening? And I don't know, it kind of bridged the gap for me. I think every single time a new project comes out, like I know y'all have seen everything everywhere all at once. Um, like, even just- I haven't yet, I'm gonna see it today. <laughs> I know, okay, okay, I can't okay. wait. So, I'm so happy I for you. I'm so excited. So happy for you too. But even <laughs> that is a film that just came out and I was weeping halfway through. Or like, no, like the whole time. And my friend was like, why are you crying? This isn't even sad. I'm like, because you don't understand. Like, I am still, I am still in that process of being represented and seeing myself on screen and also learning about this culture that for a really long time, like, I didn't really feel like was mine growing up in Orlando, Florida. Like there's not many Asians around here. So if anything too, when I did watch films or television shows with people who were Chinese and speaking Mandarin, you know, even though that is, that's literally my blood. I'm like, I don't feel like that's me. And slowly, but surely through the process of getting to watch um, more things with the specificity and the details that we keep talking about, it's like, I'm, I'm learning about that side of myself and it's so cushy and it's so wonderful um yeah wow so is it often is it for you guys is it often in hindsight that you realize that um you 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 were missing out on something that you didn't even know you were like longing for is it like is it like the first time you taste like a like an oreo mcflurry you're like i didn't know this existed <laughs> but it's wonderful do you know what i mean like, yeah yes. I Yes, that's actually a really, that's a really perfect way to say it. Yes, absolutely. Well, it was interesting. I, I mean, so during the Black Lives Matter protests in 2020, I was doing a lot of um, anti-racist reading and I read for the first time the white supremacy backpack. Have you guys heard of this? Mm -hmm. It's basically like a list of things where write that down. you can, it's basically, like, I forget who wrote it, but it's essentially like, I can, I can go to a grocery store and find the food that I, you know, that that my culture consumes easily. Um, I can very easily surround myself with people of the same race. I don't. I know. Never have to worry about, you know, if I lost a promotion because of my race. It's all that kind of thing. And wow. I'm white passing, um, so I assumed that I would relate to a lot more of the list than I did. And as I was going through, I was like, No, wait, no. Mm. No, like it was, it was really eye opening in a way that I, because I don't know about um, how y'all felt the way that you were raised, but I was definitely raised. My mom de-emphasized um, her culture and just wanted she wanted to assimilate. She wanted us to just be white, and 
it was kind of wow it was it was really painful weirdly going through it and going yeah i can't surround myself with people that are like me easily at all i i don't see any of the food that i represent like i see as home and you know in in places that i go to i can't you know it was it was this strange thing and it was this exactly as you're saying this sort of realization of like i've kind of been walking through the world um with something missing and and kind of just going this is fine and it's only sort of more so now even that i'm thinking about and embracing and exploring mm -hmm. this part of me more um and it's so much more fulfilling and it's it makes me kind of sad that i didn't have that when i was younger yeah uh, it was a fairly similar for me um as a young Latino, because uh, both my parents immigrated to the States from El Salvador in the 80s during the whole, you know, the U.S. involvement in the Civil War down there. Um, and, you know, uh, also sort of like looking in hindsight, I didn't in hindsight, I was like the first time I felt represented was like watching Spy Kids because I'm like, you have like Antonio Banderas as a dad. You have these mixed oh, race yeah. kids because my parents are both from El Salvador, but um, my mom, her lineage is more of the um, in indigenous side of the population. And my dad is pale with green eyes. So it has like European ancestry. So sort of seeing this sort of like mixed race family that early on with like Carla Gugino and Antonio Banderas as a parent, I was like, that was kind of like the first time. And then like later, the only sitcom I really had growing up was like the Brothers Garcia and the George Lopez show. Those were like wow. the only two. And then like, not until I was an adult, when I saw Coco, I was like, I mean, everyone oh. cried during that movie, but I was like, why am I crying? And then oh. seeing In the Heights was similar because of, um, you know, Abuela Claudia's immigrant experience. And I'm like, that's literally like my parents and my grandparents experience coming to the States and it hit especially hard because I had lost my, my grandmother during the pandemic and as well as my grandfather. Um, so just sort of seeing all of these immigrant experiences for me and finally seeing my family's like stories told, whether they immigrated from Cuba or any or the Dominican Republic or wherever, again, it's super specific, but still so relatable for someone like me and, and, you know, <clears throat> again, you don't really realize what you were missing until you finally have it. Um, but yeah, yeah. It's really like hard to explain that, that to we're someone. Watching. Yeah. yeah. Well, also I feel like through the interchanging of stories, that's when hindsight pops up and you're like, oh my God, like, I didn't realize I even experienced that when I was a kid. I think like even watching films or just having conversations with, you know, other Asian Americans, I mean, just even what we're doing right now, being able to really be honest about the things that we experienced growing up and like the lack of um it's it's so weird experiencing it in hindsight because it's like like you just kind of realize how deeply you stuff those things down or just how normal they were for you growing up in the environment that you were um and now like the fact that we are literally sitting here on this podcast and like it's so cool because even i think like i don't know like when i was living up in vancouver like this last year um the cast of this this film came up there and it was an all asian cast I just remember being like, oh my God, like we have to hang out. Like I get to surround <laughs> myself with people now. I mean, even literally like my dad took me to the bank the other day and um, there was this Chinese woman who like literally almost started crying when I walked in. Cause she was like, oh my, like we don't, we don't have oh, that God. around here. And I just like hugged her and I was like, I'm, I'm so sorry. In Florida. Like, in Florida, I mean, like, it, yeah, in this town specifically, okay. it's, we have, like, me, and then yeah. sadly to this day still, I just caught up with another high school friend. They were like, how's the other Ling Ling? And I was like, what did you just say? And, like, I left this town, and I used to be Ling Ling, and now this other girl who lives here is Ling Ling, and I'm like, y'all, like, we're just, like, the two Asian girls in town. I mean, I'm sure there's many others, but, like, especially because of the way people are treated as well, no one wants to be seen around here. It's very, very interesting. It's, it is interesting. I think there's like, like it's, uh, I think it's just so automatic for, for people to try to relate to anything. Like we were talking mm -hmm. about, you know, not being able, not, not seeing lots of, you know, white roles on TV and in the media. But like, I, I, I don't know, maybe it's different for you guys, but I can't honestly say that I didn't relate to them. Like I related to a lot of white roles and I related to, mm -hmm. you know, I, I dressed up as Superman. I dressed up as, you know, they were just always traditionally white, but I still related to them. Um, and we're, we're very 
good at doing that because there's just basic human things that we want like we want to have a purpose we want to have great relationships we want to, we want challenges and the struggle like we could relate to those things but there is something really magical when all the puzzle pieces lock in just right it's like yeah. you know the kind of button toys and you can you, you can jam a circle into a square hole but when the circle fits like it slides right in and you're like yes that's a ticket um so that's such I a good that's point magical. <clears throat> and the sad thing about realizing it in hindsight is you've spent a lot of your life not realizing it and um, it would be wonderful um, for representation if you know the, the newer generations can realize it sooner and sooner and I'm mm-hmm. sure in, in our industry while we're working we meet a lot of uh, like veteran actors who's been in it for decades like Tai Ma on Kung Fu he's been in it for a long long time and he tells he tells us all these stories about what it was like and what he was fighting for and how great and lucky it is for us and for himself to be on a show where it's a full wow. Asian cast and we have the opportunities. So like at, we are his future generation and we need to find our future generation so they can get that sooner. That's such a good point. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and, and like, I don't, I hope to have the chance to talk to some people of the upcoming future generation where I, I want to know if they like me, because going back to what you said about hindsight and reflecting on unpacking everything that we did go through, but not being able to do it until now. Mm -hmm. And now it's finally dawning. I mean, the last couple of years since 2020 ish, 2019 ish of like, Oh, I spent so much time in a white suburban town, Yes. just mild on a very mild level like i was never like my life was never like in danger i was never physically in danger but like i spent so much time surviving and trying to hide and trying to not be outed as a different person as an asian i just wanted to blend in y- you can think of me as white adjacent if you want like that to me was all good like that's how i framed it in my mind because lest i be discovered as the minority and lest i have to like god damn it do I, if i have to hear someone turn on a, an awful stereotypical Asian dubbing accent when talking to me, you know, from like my white high school uh, uh, schoolmates, like I just didn't want anything to do with that. So I clung to this proximity to whiteness and I just pushed, I like sort of ran away from my Asianness as much as possible. And I was near Queens. Like I wasn't that far from Asian people. Like, I, I had grew up with a brother and sister in the house. I grew up with both a Chinese uh, a mom and dad in the house. And we did see our grandparents, you know, every so often our, our cousins, and all that stuff. So, uh, but, but all that to say is like, you know, I, I do, I hope that the, the, the people coming up now and even, even all of us now, and even like for and not even just the future generation, but even now, like, I hope we can feel like we don't have to hide. Now, granted, there are some people in the, some communities right now, anywhere in the world who still feel like they have to do that because people are terrible and people are still going to say shit like Ling Ling. And it's like, you just, there's only so much you can do to, 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 to stop that in the moment. Like sometimes it is just, we know how it is. Sometimes it's easier to just like let them say it and then just let them walk away because we just don't have the energy to address it every single time. Like mm-hmm. just last night I was in West Hollywood and like I was sitting um, at the outdoor patio, like facing the sidewalk. So I'm sitting at the bar with my friend, we're having a drink we're not wearing masks as we're sitting outside and we're wearing and we're having a drink and Mm -hmm. uh, 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 a man who, I mean, I'll just paint the picture for you. I, from what I could observe, he appeared to be a homeless, uh, a man. And he, he asked us if we were okay. And we're like, yeah, we're good. We're good. Yeah, we're good. Like there's no, whatever. And then he goes on to say, you don't have to wear a mask. And I was like, what? I'm so confused. And now my friend who I'm sitting with, she is a, she's a white woman. And, and the, this, this guy goes, and she's like, right away, my, she's picking up that there's something weird happening. And the guy says, you don't need to wear it. You're just breathing in your own oxygen. And I'm like, what is happening right now? And then, so she's, because she's very, you know, she's like, she's tough and I'm kind of not. And she's like telling this man to go away. This man goes away. The next person he talks to is an Asian woman on the sidewalk. And there's a crowd of people at that corner. And the only per- the person he beelined to was an Asian woman. Then he disengaged from her somehow very quickly, luckily for her. And then he's now surrounded by a crowd of Caucasian people. It's all white people in that corner. And he didn't go up to a single one of them. And my friend was one who pointed out he's going after Asian people. 
I was like, mm-hmm. whoa, this is crazy. I just, there's so much to unpack here. And I'm just, this situation just makes me just sad. I'm not even angry. I'm not even offended at this point. I am just sad. Um, I think it's an interesting thing. Couldn't even run away from it. Everything that's been happening since the pandemic that Mm -hmm. like the idea of like model minority or like adjacent to whiteness, as you were saying, Eddie, it's, it's so interesting to see how I, I, I do think and hope that the younger generation is is like fuck assimilating i want to embrace who i am because it's like in in situations like that you're like it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how well you try to hide yourself like that Mm -hmm. it's it's scary um but it's this thing of like i i just was speaking to so many asian friends after all the attacks that were happening and they there was this outrage that i'd never seen from them that i actually found it was really, it made me happy to see because I feel like so many of us have been, in particular, not as much for me because I'm white passing, but like trying to make yourself small and I'm not trouble. I won't cause any trouble. I'll Mm -hmm. just blend. Don't worry about me. And it's like, it does, in in a white supremacist culture, it doesn't matter if you, you can be, you'd be the best at blending in the world and it doesn't matter when their fucking sights get on you. And so mm-hmm. it, it's I, talking to friends, it's become this thing of like, fuck this. Like, why am I, why am I trying? Yes. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yep. I, it's very clear the situation that I'm in and the culture that I'm in. And I can keep trying to blend and be small and not be seen. <clears throat> or I can just fully embrace who I am, where I come from, who my parents are, and and become a whole a more whole person because mm-hmm. they fucking hate you no matter what. The people that are gonna hate you just they just hate. So it's it's <laughs> it's been really scary and painful. And at the same time it like makes me happy to see friends that are like, I'm fucking done. <laughs> I'm done yeah. with yeah. like trying to blend. Yeah. That's- that's really yeah. heartbreaking to hear. That's that's really tough because I I feel like um like yes uh, fuck assimilation and all that but like assimilation is part of getting along isn't it like we can all live in cities and have a uh, you know millions of strangers all fitting together that will never happen in the animal kingdom right mm-hmm. because they're all part of your tribe but we have millions of strangers together and we don't really have much trouble we have real issues but it's not like the whole thing's collapsing um, unless you view it from a certain perspective, you know? So like, that's a part of it. But the sad part of it is what you mentioned before. Like you can't um, celebrate your difference while getting along and sharing the things you have in common at the same yes. time, right? And you need yes. to be able to live like that. It's really tough. Like for, for anyone who grows up in a, <clears throat> in a immigrant family, you know, you have to act a different way outside of the family and inside of the family. You wear those two hats at the same time. Because, you know, you go in the family, in an immigrant family, you have to, you know, you have to act as if you are from the culture your parents immigrated from. And then when you're out, you have to act this Western and assimilate where everyone knows and accepts you and you go according to the rules. But we do have to, like, that's part of growing up, I think, to have to wear those two hats at the same time and be okay with it that's what we learn it's difficult but we learn as we grow like it's okay to be two things at once we're not just one thing our identities are a mesh of all these different things at once right so um and it's just like sometimes it really saddens me and I, I can't, I've been involved in this I've been involved in this in, in some like rallies and stuff where I where I pointed out and acted out in anger against who I thought was racist. But um, but I heard something recently that really touched me. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a statement that um, don't, don't kill what you hate, save what you love. Oof. Because there Damn. are always things to kill. You'll never, you'll never kill all the demons. But if you save what you love, at least you can nurture that and let that grow and spread that because that's the thing that replicates against all the hate, you know? I think it's interesting you mentioning or Ludi mentioning like wearing the both hats because I think growing up with mixed culture and being like, do I have to be Chinese? Do I have to be white? 
Um, Cause you know, when I, when I walk up to a Chinese person and I don't speak Mandarin or Cantonese, it's almost like disgrace. And then I walk up to a white person and, you know, for so long growing up, like, I didn't think I was white, but Ludi, what you were mentioning earlier too, about like relating to a lot of white characters on TV. Yeah, I did relate to them, but that's because I literally like, you want so desperately to relate to something and that's all that there is there. So when you do say like, it's not that I never felt represented, but it's, I never felt like truly, truly represented until all the detail came after. But like, it's interesting seeing that when you talk about the differences, like, it is hard to be the same when you have to talk about these differences. You know, I've had some really difficult conversations with people that, you know, growing up now, don't call me Ling Ling. That's not okay anymore. Because when I was in high school, I just wanted, I wanted to be cool. I wanted to be loved. Like I didn't want to be the one who's like, Hey, like, stop it. Don't call me that. And it's like, then all of a sudden you're like, not cool for standing up for the fact that you are being made fun of. And so similarly, like you, Eddie too, like, I didn't want to be white, but like, I think deep down, I was like, I don't really even know how to be Asian. And, and like, that's never really been celebrated for me or yeah. celebrated in general. So, you know, to be white, like I, I think when I was younger, I would get this compliment, like, you're not like other Chinese girls, like you're a cool Chinese girl. And I ran to the wind with that until literally just a couple of years ago. I'm like, F that, both hats. I'm a Chinese woman and I live in America. And that's yeah. awesome. Like the fact that I am both, it's also like, I feel like that is exactly why stories need to be continued to be fleshed out in such detailed ways, because it's not one or the other. It can be both. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think, yeah, I think having a very honest conversation, it's um, coming from my perspective, I can imagine how difficult it is for Asian Americans because, you know, whether you're born here or not, like your parents, your grandparents, or maybe even yourself, you 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 immigrated for a reason. Either you were running, you're, you you were running to something, or you were running from something. So there is that history there. And when you come when you come to America, you want to assimilate. So there's a certain forgetting about the culture that you came from. And being being May being Asian Heritage Month, you know, um, API Heritage Month, it's like it's it's really tough to imagine new things if you don't know like it's if you don't know where you come from in the first place you don't have that mm-hmm. cultural root and you have to work especially hard to go back and discover it and know where it's from because you might be getting bits and pieces from your parents or from the people that you engage you engage with but you get it through their lenses and through whatever yes. baggage that they claim right so this is this is you, do you guys remember uh, back a while ago when people were like, like putting minority faces on movie posters like Harry Potter and oh my God. Um, <laughs> there, there's even a music video there's a there's an Asian rapper what was his name uh, dumbfounded have you seen that mm-hmm. music video mm-hmm. you should see it. so it's a whole music video he put himself like his, his, he deep deep faked himself on like Oscar speeches and like the 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 tent poles and the mega hits right and that made me realize something is that like, while reimagination in representation is a great thing, like we can picture yourself in these things and we realize what we've lacked all along, but we have to reimagine things from um, like, for the lack of a better word, I hate this word, but from a white perspective, like we reimagine the things that white people have come up with in that culture, you know? Because it's really difficult to imagine things yourself without a root, without the root of your own culture. So that's why you have to reimagine. But if we could not be ashamed of our culture and even dive deeper into the past and then discovering, okay, where that came from. And I'm, I'm American, but I'm also, I came from this as well. And that gives me more um, richness in how I represent myself and how I am as a person, then you don't have to reimagine things. Then you can imagine new, new stories and create new stories. And that's why I think the, mm. the new wave of creators, especially creating our stories and telling our stories and our nuanced perspective is so important because it, if you really come from the root of it, then you'll have something magical and something really authentic. Yeah, with that, with that sort of like, the way I relate to that is like, 
I spent so much time, like Leah said, like not feeling American enough, not white enough, and then not feeling Chinese enough and feeling like I was just letting everybody down in a way. Um, mm-hmm. I spent much of my life looking back I'm like, oh, I never felt adequate, you know, because somebody's gonna tell me your Chinese is no good. Oh, you don't speak Chinese. And then the other hand, it's like, I, I had a, I had a kid in my third grade class is like, yeah, we don't want Matt and I don't want to play with you. And I was like, why? And he just blurts out <laughs> because you're Chinese. And I was like, what? I kind of laughed at him. I, I, I wasn't offended at the time. But looking back, it was just so um, just so wild to hear. It was like, I couldn't even believe it. I was like, this is this is fake, right? Like, this isn't real. Um, but, but like hearing kids say that to me, it was just like, ah, how that does, this doesn't compute for me. Um, and then fast forward to, to now that I'm older, like Ludi said about like, I, I, I found, I looking back, I spent so much time trying to live up to an idea of something, how to be like something. And, mm. and, and now I'm like, and then on Kung Fu, I'm just like, okay, I can never satisfy. I can't satisfy every Asian watching every Asian person watching our show. I can't satisfy every old white person who watched the original Kung Fu series. You know, I, I just, we cannot satisfy everyone with exactly what everyone's expectations are. And that goes with the same thing for ourselves as individuals. You cannot satisfy everyone's expectations. So the best thing I found that I could do is just try how to just be me and take everything that I know. And the more that I can just try to be me, the happier I'll just be. And I was like, wait a second. I've heard people give me this advice before. But I didn't have a scope <laughs> to frame this until now within this job, within the year that we're living in and seeing what the hell is mm-hmm. happening in the news constantly. It's a, it's a constant barrage, you know, where I'm like, all right, I just have to it's everybody is going through it. Everybody's saying I'm having a hard time, but this is just right now the best way I can I can handle this. Something that Lodi just said was pretty dope though. Like what you were talking about, instead of using the white template, which we've had for so long, just authentically creating new stories and doing the damn thing. Like I'm yeah. definitely gonna think about that too. That was really cool, Lodi. Um, so we are coming to the end of our, we're coming uh, close to the end of our time, unfortunately, because I know um, uh, Leah has to has to go. So we, I know we could probably talk for another hour about all of this, um, but you know, maybe we'll revisit the conversation <laughs> at another point. Um, but just uh, before we go, we always ask this question um, on our show in closing, uh, in 10 words or less, what advice would you guys give to a young actor? 10 words or less? Create your own content. The things you're insecure about now will become your best attributes. Love that. Yeah, I like that. That's okay. something that's I think I have something similar to that is uh, love the way you suck. <laughs> Ludi. <laughs> I love that. I you asked me this question last week when we did this. And so um, I don't want to repeat it. I'm going to just throw out something new. I'm going to I'm going to quote Bruce Lee on this one. And he said something to the effect of I'm paraphrasing here. Um, learn the rules so that you can break them. Love that. You guys, wow. <laughs> well, everyone, thank you all so much for joining us on the show today. Um, hope to have you each back. Eddie, we just chatted, so I won't keep on <laughs> with these conversations. <laughs> but, no, no, I love it. It's great. <laughs> uh, you know, these again, these conversations can go on forever, especially talking about the industry representation and, and just everyone's sort of individual experiences. Um, so really thank you all for taking the time uh, for chatting with us. Um, we'll just go around really quick. Uh, social media handles, Instagram, where can folks find you? Ludi Lynn everywhere. And uh, Ashley? It's Ashley Birch everywhere, basically. Leah? It's Leah M. Lewis. And sometimes there's a one at the end, but you'll have to figure that out on which platform. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Eddie. I'm uh, Eddie Luhu on Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> Aww, cute. <laughs> so good. Awesome. And you can all follow us on Instagram at Actors with Issues. Give me a follow at Juanial Official. And be sure to check out our full video interviews at youtube.com slash Actors with Issues podcast. Or listen on the go wherever you get your podcast every Monday. When for the month of May, we'll have bonus episodes every Thursday because we have so many guests this month. We just had to squeeze them all in as much as we could. And be sure to catch Kung Fu and Nancy Drew on The CW, The Ghost and Molly McGee on Disney Channel and Disney+. Plus. I'm Juaniala. This is Actors with Issues. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>